Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This happened last June, and back in those days, I was a motorcyclist. I bought my bike after I graduated, and I used to ride it at every chance that I got. I didn't even have a direction in mind, I just loved riding. I was riding one evening, and I knew that I had the day off on the following day, so I felt like going kind of far. I had a good night out riding, and I decided to head home sometime after midnight. I was on my way back towards Setagaya in Tokyo. The roads were not so busy, and I was taking it easy. Then, as if all of a sudden, the car in front stopped. It stopped at such a speed that it collided with a guardrail. I was shocked to see an accident happen right before my eyes, and to be honest, I was kind of scared. I had no other choice but to pull over and try to figure out what happened. I raced over to the driver's side window, and I saw that the driver was a female. She was visibly distressed, and she couldn't stop shaking her head, and her hands were firmly clamped onto the steering wheel. Oh, this is bad, I thought to myself. I started off by asking if she was alright in a gentle tone as I could muster, and I waited a few seconds, but she didn't reply to my question. I started to panic. This was serious, and I realized that I should call the police and so I did. While waiting for the police, I asked several times if the woman was alright, and eventually, she got out of the car. She didn't look hurt but her skin had gone very pale, and almost to the point that it looked blue. She was muttering something. I couldn't make it out what she was saying, so I leaned my ear close to her mouth, and she kept murmuring. What? What have I done? What have I done? I could hear the tremble in her voice and then, as if in an answer to her own question, she said something. I've run over a child. I've run over a child. I've run over a child. She kept repeating these words. Her voice gathered strength and volume, and it was very hard to listen to her panicked wails. I was deeply disturbed, and it was a frightening situation. Then I remembered that I was behind her, and I didn't see a child in the road. I was certain that there was no one around. Plus, it was the dead of night. I looked back and I couldn't see a child anywhere. I sat with that woman, and I tried to calm her down for a while, but occasionally, I stood up and I went in search of the child that she thought she had hit with her car. There were no children in the area. A few moments later, the police arrived, and I spoke with one of the officers, and he searched with me for this child. The officer asked me about what had happened repeatedly, and I repeatedly told him that all I saw was the lady in front swerve and then hit the guardrail. I said that I didn't see anyone on the road. The officer went and asked the woman about what had happened, and I went with him to listen. According to the woman, she saw a young child dart out into the road ahead of her car, and she heard and felt the collision. But no matter what we did and no matter where we searched, we couldn't find the child. The officer started back towards his patrol car while talking into his radio, and the woman was looking around the road absent-mindedly, and I watched as her eyes fell on the roadside mirror. You know those mirrors that you sometimes see in the rural areas that allow you to see oncoming traffic around the bends? They're a circular type, and they are usually on a pole, high enough for the driver to see, but not be distracted. I think they are sometimes known as convex mirrors. Well, 
That's what she looked at. And the moment she laid her eyes on it, a terrible scream rose from the pit of her stomach. The officer was shocked as I was to hear this and he rushed over to her. Notice that she was looking at the roadside mirror. I came over to look as well. And we looked into the mirror and saw a child in the road. There was no one there when we looked without the help of the mirror. But when we looked into the mirror, the child was there. It was the strangest thing that I have ever seen and I couldn't believe my eyes. The child looked to be about four or five years old. She was wearing a kindergarten uniform, looked like the kid went to a good school. And that child stared at us with an utterly expressionless look on her face. The police officer and I turned to look at the road almost simultaneously and there was no child in the road. We looked back at the mirror and we could only see ourselves and the female driver sat on the side of the road. Our faces looked incredibly pale and our mouths hung open in shock. The woman then exploded into a full-blown state of panic and the ambulance that was intended for the child took the woman away. And before she went, she asked me for my contact information, saying she might call me to ask about what had happened again. And the officer said that for her sake, it wouldn't be a good idea. And it would be better to forget about the incident entirely. His face was also as white as snow. I insisted that the officer should take my information, but there was to be no further contact from anyone that I met that day. I am sorry, but it has left me very confused and troubled. I think about it often. What really happened that day is a mystery to me, but I believe that I had a run-in with a paranormal and that little girl's spirit still remains in the spot that she might have met her final moments. I've been a police officer for somewhere close to a decade, and I've spent a significant portion of my career out on the road making sure that people out there aren't doing anything too crazy. For the most part, the job is pretty boring, which I guess is one of those don't look a gift horse in the mouth kind of things. If my job wasn't boring, it would probably be a lot more dangerous. I pretty much just drive around and make sure people aren't breaking the law or respond to calls that come in nearby. I've had a few run-ins with crazy situations, sure, but really, for the most part, everything is fairly routine. That all holds true until you get thrown onto the night shift. The minute you get into the car and out onto the road after the sun goes down, things get a bit more hectic and a lot more unpredictable. Sure, things have a certain level of standard. However, there are far more moments where things do get out of hand. Most nights involve calls where people think that someone's in their home, or people calling to say that the neighbors left their garage door open. But some of the things you run into do absolutely get crazy. There was one night that I was driving on my patrol and things were going pretty standard. I had issued a couple of tickets and responded to one or two calls that were pretty uneventful. I then got a call asking to check out a business alarm at a local strip mall and was headed towards said alarm when I saw what looked like a young child standing on the side of the road. I slowed my car down and made sure that I wasn't just going crazy or seeing things, and sure enough, on the side of the highway on-ramp, there was a small child. They couldn't have been much older than six or seven. I pulled over, grabbed my radio, calling in that I was stopping at a potential emergency, informing them that there was a child out near the highway, and that they would need to send someone else to the business alarm. They asked if I needed more units at my location, and I informed them that I wasn't sure at that moment. Obviously, we're trained to keep calm in situations like this, and to try and control ourselves, but my mind was honestly racing. 
it was a bit after midnight at this point. Why was there a child walking on the road by the highway? Where were his parents? Was this some kind of runaway situation? I flicked my lights on to try and get the kid's attention, and I jumped out to go find him. As soon as I got on to the shoulder of the road, I heard this kid sobbing somewhere a bit back. I sped up my pace and called out to see if the kid would run over to me once I got his attention. The second that he heard my voice shout over to him, I could hear him crying louder and yelling out to me asking for help. This made me jump into action more than I already had. The kid being out there was confusing at first, for sure, but instead of him just being there and upset, he was now calling out for help. This told me that something else was going on here. As I ran back toward where the kid was, I called into my radio for dispatch and told them to send a second unit to this location and to have medical on standby just in case. When I got over to the little boy and knelt down to try to ask what was going on, I noticed that he had blood on his shirt, and he did look a little cut up. The poor kid was just sitting there sobbing and yelling something incoherently. I let him get it out a bit before I told him to calm down and asked him what was going on. After a short bit of back and forth, he started saying things that made sense, but were dreadful to hear. The first thing he said that I was able to make sense of was car crash. As soon as those two words came out of his mouth, my ears perked up, and I was kind of starting to piece things together. I asked him if he was in a car crash, and he shook his head yes. I asked him if he was in the car with his parents, and he again nodded, and then mentioned that his dad was driving, and they somehow got into an accident. This is what I was expecting, and honestly not wanting to hear. I grabbed my radio and told the dispatch to get medical out here, and as I was calling it in, my backup pulled up to the scene. As he approached, I told him that we may have an accident with an unconscious occupant somewhere, and that the occupant was likely to be this child's father. I went back to the little boy and asked him if the accident happened nearby, and if he could show me. He said yes, and then pointed over toward where there was a ravine by the entry ramp. I stood up and walked over toward where the dip was, and I shined my light down into the ditch. And sure enough, there was a small sedan lying upside down at the bottom. This is where things really jumped into motion. I called over to the other officer, and I informed him to take the child away from the scene to call for more backup, and to get medical down into the ravine as soon as they got there. And I then told him that there was a vehicle down in said ravine. From here, it was mostly adrenaline, and I don't remember everything that happened. The most I recall was that I ran down into the ditch and searched the car, and saw an unconscious man buckled into the driver's seat. I know that I was pulling at the door and trying everything I could to get him out of the car, and then medical showed up and took over. At the end, as things got pieced together, it all fell into place, and I learned exactly what had happened. Apparently, this man had to go somewhere, and he didn't want to leave his son home alone, so he decided that he wanted to take him with him. Unfortunately, with it being as late as it was, he was apparently starting to doze off while driving, and he had done so while he was entering onto the highway from the ramp. When he did, he ended up going over the side and flipping his car down into the ravine. Thankfully, through some miracle from above, when the car flipped, neither of them were killed. The father had some moderate injuries, a concussion, and his son had a few scratches, scrapes, and bruises, but nothing that was life-threatening or anything like that. And like I said, it had to have been a miracle that neither of them were killed or seriously injured, and I'm beyond glad of the fact that I happened to be driving by at that exact moment that I needed to be. However, I think this experience should hold strong as a testament 
for why you should never get out on the road while you're tired, unless absolutely necessary. In this situation, no one was seriously injured, but I have absolutely seen wrecks at night where the people were not so lucky. As an officer, I have to say, please, be careful out there, and make sure that you're awake and aware when you get behind the wheel. I was driving when it happened. It made local news, so I want to keep names and locations out of it. I was driving with my wife, and we were heading off for a summer camping trip. The night was full of sound of crickets and cicadas, and there was a fair degree of humidity in the air. We were going up through the mountainous woods, and despite it being the height of summer, it was dark out in the shade of the giant rocks. But to be honest, it was our first trip away as a married couple after the honeymoon. I mean, we did a tons of family stuff and thank yous to our friends. It was nice to do something alone. Just us. And to be frank, I was more than looking forward to that idea. While passing along a bridge, my wife suddenly shouted, Someone just jumped into the river! I pulled over and looked in the direction she was pointing. We got out and had a look around, and I noticed that there was a bicycle leaning against the railings, and there were a pair of shoes neatly positioned facing towards the river. What the hell were they doing? Night swimming? Or something much more fatal, perhaps? And when I got close to the guard railing at the end of the road, I realized how high up the bridge was. There must have been about a 20 to 30 feet drop below. Excitement surrounding our trip disappeared into the night air, as now there was a grave situation in front of us. The authorities needed to be contacted. It was a big fuss. The police and the fire department turned up in a hurry and tried to search the river. But we were told that we were not allowed to leave until the police had conducted their investigation. We were being detained. I started to think that we were being treated more like suspects than witnesses. I was so bored of sitting by the side of the road waiting for it to be all over. Sorry if that sounds selfish, but I was really looking forward to my trip. And a few hours pass, and then someone reported that they had discovered a body downstream in the river. He didn't make it, it was obvious. After witnessing that poor person's final moments and being questioned for hours, we were finally free. But that night's incidences left us both depressed and disheartened. When we got to our destination, we wanted nothing more than some shut-eye, so we headed to bed. The next morning, I had a little Google to see if there were any further details announced regard the man on the bridge. I couldn't find much, but later the police called. I learned something shocking through my conversation with a detective. He suspected that the shoes were placed there intentionally, and not by the man who jumped. He asked my wife and I if we saw anyone in the area nearby when we approached. I didn't see anyone, and my wife said that she didn't either. I asked why it was so important, and he said that the reason why it was so important was because the man who had supposedly jumped had been dead for at least a week before his body was anywhere near that bridge. We were floored by that. It wasn't a suicide, but a murder. Then I remember the bicycle which was resting against the guardrail. Perhaps, the person who tossed that body into the river was in the same area as we were while we were calling the police. They could have been watching us, or was that part of the staging of the scene? What if we didn't call the police? Would we have been in danger? Come to think of it, I wasn't able to recall if the bike remained there until we left. Perhaps, before the police came, 
someone used it to hightail it out of there. There are various interpretations of what happened that night, and it's a night that we can't ever forget. This actually happened to me last week, and I'm still kind of freaking out about it in my head and trying to process what I saw. I live in an apartment complex that was recently built, like, within the last year. They started tearing down a patch of trees that blocked the highway on the other side to build this place, so it disrupted some wildlife, I'm sure. The town I live in doesn't have much in the way of multi-dwelling homes, like apartments. It's been more for retirees and senior living, so besides moving away, this was one of the cheapest places to live other than a house, so that's why I chose it, besides the fact that it was close to my mom and my job. So, to get to the complex, you have to take a road that was basically made to get to this place. It's pretty long because it sits back in that carved-out field, and since it's still surrounded by some trees, you can still see a bit of wildlife. When I'm driving, I typically go slower down the road because I see deer, possums, squirrels, and even a few feral cats cross it. It's beautiful at my apartment, too, because sitting out on the balcony, I get a view of the trees. And sometimes I can see deer in there or a bunch of birds flying around. One of my neighbors actually has bird and squirrel feeders that she not only put by her patio, but also closer to the trees, so they were away from the people. It's a nice view. Anyways, this happened when I was driving home from my mom's place late one night. I went there to have dinner after work since I was off later and she invited me over, so I didn't have to spend money on food. I could never say no to her cooking anyways. It was about 9 or so when I left, and I was already feeling tired. As I was driving back, I was trying my hardest to focus as the lights dimmed when I went between the streetlights. At one point, I saw something on all four legs crossing the road, so I started slowing down. As I came to a stop, I really got a better look at the animal and I was horrified. My car was just a bit in front of the light where the animal was on the other side of it. Based on what I could see in the light and its shape, I could tell it was a deer. But there was something horribly wrong with it. What I thought at first was mud or something in its fur it had to be blood and flesh. It looked like all the fur on that side of the body was gone, and I was just looking at skin. The only way I can think to describe it was like that side of its body had been scraped off. Its leg was the same way, and in fact, I'm pretty sure I could see part of the leg bone and its jawbone. I was panicking in my head, thinking that something obviously happened to this thing, and it was going to collapse right in front of me. Instead, it just stood there, staring at me as if there was nothing wrong with it. In fact, it didn't even seem intimidated or scared of me at all. Still confused about what I was seeing, though, and since it wasn't moving, I decided to get out of my car and try to get closer. The minute I opened my door and started walking around it, the smell hit me. It was the smell of decay and rot, I felt like I was going to be sick, so I pulled my shirt up over my nose to try to mask the smell. I got a little closer, and I could confirm that I was definitely seeing raw flesh. I really don't understand how this deer was alive and even standing in front of me. I said something under my breath, like, what the hell? Or something to that effect. And that's when the deer started backing up. I didn't know what it would do or could do being injured to that extent, so I backed up to give it space, and that's when I heard a loud plop coming from the trees on the right. 
where the deer was walking from. Within the time it took me to look in that direction, the deer bolted across the road and took off. I watched it for a few seconds as it ran away without as much as a limp, when I heard another sound coming from the opposite side. It sounded like something big was falling to the ground, like out of the tree. At this point, that putrid smell of death was still lingering, and I was getting this overwhelming sense of dread, so I ran back to my car, locking the doors, and I just sat there looking into the trees. That's when I saw something moving around in the trees that very clearly was not a deer. It was trying to walk on all four, but the movement wasn't right. It was choppy and very uncoordinated. It almost reminded me of a fawn trying to walk for the first time, as well as maybe a human trying to walk with their hands. And the back was very rigid and curved. I had no clue what I was looking at, but it terrified me, so I took off. I've never driven that fast down the road, but I knew that I didn't want to be there anymore maybe even wasn't supposed to be there. When I got home, I looked around before getting out of my car, and when it looked safe, I made a mad dash to the building, pulling the door shut, and then running up the stairs to my place and quickly locking the door. I went and looked out my balcony door to see if I could see anything on that side of the woods, which was opposite from the one I was at. So, I didn't really expect to see anything, but I was still paranoid and scared. When I didn't see anything, I took some time to try and calm myself down and called my dad to talk to him about it. As expected, he told me the deer was probably in some kind of accident and was in shock and probably died shortly after my encounter with him. I tried to stay reasonable and keep that in my mind, but then I was confused about the big thing trying to imitate a deer. However, I didn't tell my dad about that one. I figured he would probably just think I was seeing things. I haven't told anyone else about this until now because it's still nightmare fuel for me. I want to be reasonable and say that maybe it was just another deer with some kind of weird deformity, but was it? Was that really what I saw? Or is there something more sinister in those woods? All I know is I haven't seen it since, thankfully, and I don't stop like that anymore at night, no matter what road I'm on. I was out late driving the other night. I was heading home, and I think it was about midnight. To get back to my place, I have to go through some winding dark mountain roads. They're always kind of spooky in the middle of the night, but that night, something else terrified me. I rounded a bend in the road and had to slam on the brakes. There was a woman in the middle of the road with her arms outstretched in a stop kind of gesture. She was blocking the road. I didn't like the situation, but I had no choice but to stop. When my car came to a standstill, she approached. She gestured for me to roll down the window, and I obliged. She asked me for a ride. According to the woman's story, she had been left behind by a boyfriend of hers, and they had an argument, and he told her to get out, and apparently, she didn't even have a chance to get her purse. She was saying that she couldn't even call her parents to get her because her phone was in her boyfriend's car. I instantly felt sorry for her, but I also thought to myself, Why do I have to give her a lift? Then another thought crept into my mind. What if this is fake? There is no guarantee that what she told me was even remotely true. It did kind of seem like a well-rehearsed story. Everything was covered, no phone, no wallet, and the reason for her being alone out here. I had my suspicions that she wasn't alone out here, and her role was to stop my car. I felt like that there could be people hiding by the sides of the road in the trees and bushes, waiting for their moment. 
Maybe I would be kidnapped or something, or maybe this is some kind of police thing. I have seen too many movies to know that whatever this was didn't seem legitimate. Something else was happening now, and she was really escalating. She was close to tears and pleading for me, but her performance didn't seem genuine. It felt a little forced, and a little studied and unnatural. No matter how I looked at the situation, I couldn't convince myself that it was a good idea to let this woman in my car or to turn the engine off. I had to reply though. I tried my best to turn her down politely. I felt like a real piece of shit, but something was sketchy about the situation. She wanted my phone. I knew that was the only thing I had which gave me communication to others. I needed it. But also, if I was to believe her story, she needed it right now just as much as I did. It was the only thing that wouldn't get her off the road too if I didn't give her a ride and she didn't accept no for an answer. When she started looking around while she was yelling at me, I realized that it was time to go. I guess she could have been signaling to someone that I couldn't see. There was no way that I was giving her my phone. It was recording the whole thing, and I thought that I would need a video and audio for my insurance company if something was about to go down. I started honking my horn at her, and slowly edging forward. She threw herself on my bonnet but then eventually let go, and I pulled away slowly and looked back in my rearview mirror. I looked back to see her calmly sit down in the middle of the road. It looked like she was already waiting for the next driver to come along. That was another weird thing. If I was in her shoes, I would at least attempt walking back towards a town, or a city, a house, or anything. I began to grow fearful for the next driver who would approach. I called the police and let them know about the situation, and then I headed home. The next day after work, I took the recording and put it on my computer as a backup in case I was ever asked for it. I spoke with my girlfriend about it, and she hated my guts for not picking that woman up. She was so, so angry at me. I was accused of being inhumane and for being plain cruel, but I still stand by my actions. It wasn't worth risking my life. The risk was too great. What's done is done, and I don't care if I am thought of as cruel or even a coward. I was there and no one else but that woman who knows better than me about the situation. What a minefield of a situation it was. Back when I was fresh out of high school, I used to be a pizza delivery driver for a certain pizza place that is open really late. Like, way later than it needs to be. I admit that delivering pizzas at like 1 in the morning is a genius way to get business from drunks and stoners, but I also have to say that the pace sucked, and I was never more tired than the 9 months that I worked at that place. This experience was a few months back, but... Thinking about it, and how it could have gone, it seriously makes me feel like I want to get sick. I won't. I'll push through getting the story written out, but it really does cause a bit of panic in me. It was a pretty typical Friday night. I was nearing the end of my shift and was actually on my last delivery from a triple that was thrown on me by my jerk of a manager who knew that I was about to leave. This being my last delivery, it was the furthest out of the three. And it was definitely in a more spread out and remote part of our town. I don't live in a big city, but it's fairly concentrated with houses that circle the epicenter, and then there are the neighborhoods that are spread out in every direction. This delivery was in one of those out-on-the-edge neighborhoods. I pulled up to the house after circling the neighborhood a couple of times trying to find the numbers, which, tangent, if you order pizza delivery, please turn on your lights so that we can see your house numbers. Anyways, I circled a couple of times, 
found the house and grabbed the pizza to walk it up to the front door. The house looked decent. It wasn't run down or anything, it was just really dark. Like maybe the occupant was in bed, or not home. Which, yes, did make me feel a bit uneasy about this delivery, though it wouldn't have been the first time that I had taken a delivery to a drunk person that had passed out after putting it in. I knocked a few times, but no answer. I pulled out my cell phone, and I called the number on the order, but it was disconnected. At this point, I assumed that the delivery was either a prank or the aforementioned drunk person. I sent my boss a text message saying, knocked, no answer, phone disconnected, heading back, and walked back to my car. I tossed the pizza bag into the back seat on the passenger side, and started to walk to the other side of my car to get in, when I started hearing footsteps come up from the side. My dumb self thought that maybe it was the customer coming out to say, Hey, sorry, I fell asleep, can I get my pizza? But of course it wasn't. No. Instead, it was a man wearing a pink hoodie, dark jogging pants, and walking straight towards me, with a gun pointed in my direction. I put my hands up and immediately braced for him to rob me, but after a moment, he finally spoke up and said, Keys, now. I nodded, reached into my pocket, and handed the guy my keys. And after a few moments of my heart racing and my face being drenched in sweat, he motions towards the car and says, Get in the passenger seat. At first I was thinking I was about to die, and then I was thinking that I could try to run as I got around the car, but again, where was I going to go? I was in the middle of a mostly empty cul-de-sac, nowhere to go but open fields, and he could easily put a round in my back if I ran. At this point, I realized I had no choice but to follow what he wanted me to do. I quickly complied with his demands, and I got in the passenger seat of the car, thinking that this was seriously going to be my final few moments. He got in the driver's seat, started the car, and started driving down the side roads. I just sat there helplessly, silently staring at the streetlights as we passed them, thinking about what I could say to plead for my life. My hands were seriously shaking, and my mind was racing as it occurred to me that this man, he wasn't wearing a mask, which meant that he didn't care if I saw his face. To me, this meant that he didn't plan to leave anyone to identify him, so I was definitely going to die. As we drove in silence, the carjacker seemed to become more and more agitated, glancing around nervously, muttering things to himself and staring at the clock in the road randomly back and forth. It felt like several hours were passing, though it was honestly only a few minutes. I actually started thinking about whether anyone would notice that I wasn't back after a while. I assumed that my manager would notice after a while since I had cash that belonged to the store and had texted him, but that was about it. A lot of strange things go through your mind when you're in this kind of situation, because really the only thing that I could think about was how I was going to get fired if I got killed. Again, not logical, but it was all I could think about. After another few moments, the carjacker pulled over to the side of the road and started breathing really fast. I didn't look at him, I didn't turn my head, I just shut my eyes thinking, well... This is where he cracks. After a few moments, he screams, This wasn't what I effing planned! And then punches the steering wheel. I jumped, and I couldn't help but look in his direction, and he was seriously crying. Like, sobbing. His eyes were filled with a strange mix of anger, desperation, and regret. And he turned to me and just said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we had to meet under these circumstances. His voice cracked as he said this, and he just shook his head like he was seriously upset. A couple more seconds pass of this 
awkward silence. And then he turns, reaches behind me, grabs the pizza bag, and exits the car, walking off into the woods on the side of the road. For a moment, I was too stunned to move. But as the feeling in my arms and feet slowly started to come back, I realized that the danger had passed. I hopped over to the driver's seat and sped away, eager to get the hell away from that man in this place. The entire time I was driving, my lip was quivering, my teeth were chattering, and I was shaking, thinking that it wasn't actually over. That someone else or something was going to jump out at me and attack me. Obviously nothing did, and I was able to make it back to the store. I got into the safety of the building, and I broke down. I was bawling my eyes out trying to explain that I was carjacked by this man, trying to explain everything that I had just gone through. Thankfully, my coworkers were able to get me settled down, but then after a few moments, my manager asked me why I hadn't called him or called the police. Honestly, at no point did it occur to me while I was driving away from the situation to grab my phone and call anyone. Stupid, I know, but panic makes it hard to think clearly. They did call the police, and they took my statement, but I couldn't tell them the exact location that he had gotten out of my car, only where he had actually carjacked me. I doubt that he was ever caught, because all I could tell them was what he was wearing in a vague direction of where he could have gone. I'm thankful that he didn't decide that I was a threat to him, or that he needed to do worse than he had, and I honestly think about that night a lot. The fact that I got out unharmed, that he apologized and then stole the pizza? What kind of situation does one have to be in to do that? I don't work there anymore, as mentioned, and I don't do anything related to driving my car or working with the public. I work in a warehouse now, and I love it because there's literally no opportunity for anything like this to ever happen again while I'm at work. And here are the top comments for my last video. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.